Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to another CyberSight live surgical webinar. This is with Kevin Barber, again, demonstrating excellence in FACO technology. He's gonna be showing how to do refractive cataract surgery with advanced technology intraocular lenses. The key things here are to look at how he examines the patients, how he sets the expectations, how he changes his technique, and really how he follows his results looking at the UCVA over time. Before he starts the surgery today, he's gonna to give us a tour of his OR to show how he has changed the patient flow pathway and gotten his entire team engaged with the refractive cataract surgical suite. Kevin, over to you. All right, good morning, Hunter. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are um, in the world. Welcome to my operating room. It's a privilege to, uh, to have you all here. So uh, the goal for today, as Hunter mentioned, is to, is to go through two live surgical cases using anterior, or I'm sorry, uh, advanced technology intraocular lenses or premium lenses. Um, so the goal is if you are just trying to incorporate this, so maybe you're early on in your career or you're just considering starting or adding ATI OLs into your practice, that's really gonna be the focus of today. It's not necessarily a deep dive into all of the finer details. Um, so I'll present two cases. The first case is a femto -faco. Um, I'll be implanting an Alcon Panoptics trifocal IOL, well, so in that, that multifocal uh, ATIOL category. Um, then um, I'll take a, a short break while the room is being turned over and I'll give a, a 10 to 15 minute uh, talk, um, really just sharing pearls. I've been doing ATIOLs for 16 years now. And so I just wanna share some of the things I've learned along the way and maybe give some uh, helpful pointers for those of you that are just trying to get started or considering uh, adding these to your practice. Then we'll come back into the uh, uh, operating room and we'll do the second case. The second case will be a non femto so it'll be a manual cataract surgery. Um, and I'll implant a, a Vividi uh, extended depth of focus lens, so a slightly different ATIOL. And we'll talk about some of the differences um, between the, those two types of, of lenses. Um, so we want to highlight a case both using the technology of intraoperative aberrometry and femtosecond laser and then also without, so that no matter what setting you uh, function in, there'll be some, uh, some applicable um, uh, knowledge there. Um, so uh, with that, what I'd like to do is just give you a quick tour just uh, so you can have some perspective and see uh, how the OR is set up. So uh, we've already done the femtosecond laser for, for this patient. The femtosecond laser is there. You can see um, our, our patient and microscope. I'll be using the Ingenuity. The Ingenuity is the 3D visualization system. So we'll be broadcasting from that, which gives uh, excellent visualization. And then I have um, Jess, my wonderful assistant in scrub tech, standing to my right with the FACO machine. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of perspective when we're talking about having um, a technology suite for refractive cataract surgery. All right, so Hunter, I'm gonna go scrub and I'll turn it over uh, to you so you can introduce us to our, our first case. Yeah, and I appreciate you highlighting uh, the first patient and we're gonna also show those clinical details on the slide. So you're gonna see a slide coming up. And really what's important with all cases with advanced technology, is making sure your fundamentals are sound. And one of the key things I wanna make sure everyone knows is you have to have confidence in your biometry. You have to have confidence and convey that confidence when you're speaking to the patient and family that you can deliver the expectations they have. The biggest challenge a lot of doctors have when they're starting ATIOL surgery is they promise too much. And no matter how good the lens performs, the patient's expectations keep growing. It's very important to let the parent, the patient, and the family know that you're trying to reduce the spectacle dependence. Do not guarantee them anything. You can't guarantee anything in life. Certainly, you can't guarantee perfect vision at distance and near. You see that this patient already has had the left eye with the panoptics lens, so they've had that expectation, and you can see they have fantastic uncorrected vision in that eye. So in, in this scenario, Kevin's going to match and do the surgery uh, in the right eye to equalize with the left. And so one of the things you'll see, which I really appreciate Kevin doing today, is showing two different types of lenses, two different types of technology with the femtosecond and the interoperative aberrometry, and then also manual techniques. 
So you'll see that this is a great case to begin with where the patient already had a very successful result in the left eye, and now we're going to match. And really, I appreciate when he details the history that the patient wants freedom from glasses. What is their motivation? What is their expectations with this surgery so that you and your team can hit the mark? Kevin, how are you looking? All right, I think I'm ready to go if you guys are. All right, so we've presented the patient and we're gonna be operating on the right eye and they've already had the panoptics in the left where you had a very successful result. And we're gonna be showing the microscope view now. And you can see a beautiful CCC was created by the femtosecond laser. So Kevin, talk us through this procedure and what you're doing, especially as you know, you're gonna be doing an ATI oil surgery. That's right. Well, I appreciate all your comments, Hunter. You're exactly right. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the talk about expectations and patient selection in just a few moments. Um, as Hunter mentioned, this patient already had a very successful outcome with the other eye, so that made the, the choice for this eye quite, uh, quite easy. So she's uh, elected to have a, a panoptics trifocal lens. So I've made my incisions here. I choose to make my incisions manually as opposed to with the femtosecond laser. The capsular excess has already been performed, so I'm going to remove that here. Um, if you're not familiar with femtosecond surgery, you can see uh, this air bubble back here. That's all that is, is just an air bubble that's created um, by the femtosecond laser application. So this is a chain cannula that I use for hydrodissection. Um, I'll go out to the periphery and, and aim posterior just a little bit. I'll then come back and do a little sub incisional hydrodissection. And that's a very successful way of, of loosening up this uh, this nucleus. And Kevin, even though the lens has been pre-treated, you're still going to do the exact same things you do with any cataract surgery. You're going to make sure you have good hydrodissection, good lens mobility, good centration, good visualization. Really all ATI oil surgery does is make you really step up your game with all the fundamentals you should have mastered uh, in your FACO career. That's exactly right. So we're, we're sticking to what we know. We're sticking to what works. So even though the femtosecond laser created the capsular excess, I still go in there and pull it around just like I would any normal capsular excess. So um, I think one of the points is when in your career as a cataract surgeon, do you make that transition into becoming a refractive cataract surgeon? And I think that's different for each person, but you do want to have a certain level of experience and confidence. Um, and so um, you, you want to be very good with just your standard basic cataract surgery and all parts of that surgery from the biometry, uh, IOL selection to the, each step of your surgical technique. All of those things need to be really comfortable skills that you already have. Um, and then you're just going to build on that as you introduce uh, advanced technology lenses. Yeah, and see I, I here really because the. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Honey. Yeah, no. I think what you said was important is that you have to have confidence in your FACO technique, but also your team and the biometry. If you're not measuring your results and you don't know your SIA, if you don't know what is your UCVA, your uncorrected visual acuity, that's that that's critical. That's going to build your confidence to hit the mark. I also want to remind the audience that if you have any questions for Dr. Barber, please put them in the chat. We'll answer them. And we're also going to put in some resources from the CyberSight Library. The first one is an excellent lecture we recently had about biometry in the 21st century. Yeah, that's exactly right, Hunter. The, when you take this, the refractive cataract surgery and advanced technology lenses, um, it requires the whole process. It's not just using a different lens implant. It's the whole process from the patient experience, staff education, patient education, um, really um, ste stepping up your game as far as biometry outcome management. It, it just forces you to pay attention to every little detail um, because that's, what, that's what's required. I mean, essentially what you're um, offering is a greater probability or chance that a patient might not have to wear glasses. Now, again, that's not important to every patient. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, but for the patients that do desire that, um, it's a privilege to, to try to offer that to them, but it does require a lot of deliberate effort on your part. So here's a tip. I do like to polish the intracapsule a little bit. I'll, I'll be a little more um, 
uh, I'll pay a little more attention to this with an API OL. Um, and so as you can see here, I'm just using the polish setting on my Tapa machine. And I'm just uh, very gently removing some of the anterior capsular um, epithelial cells here that, you, that you'll see. And um, it's good form, one. Two, this doesn't happen often, but occasionally you do have to either rotate uh, exchange and an ATI well. And so by having less epithelial cells and fibrosis there, and that can make your process, that process a little easier. All right, so the cataract's been removed. I'm now putting in um, my cohesive viscoelastic. If you can see on the right bottom corner of the microscope screen, that's the intraoperative, uh, intraoperative aberometer. I just did a, um, a pressure reading here just to make sure I've got the pressure at the right physiologic level. I'm gonna make sure the cornea is nice and um, wet and moist. I then use a flex cell to remove any excess. And Kevin, two questions right. that we have. One is with the femtosecond laser, what do you set as the diameter for your capsular rescues? Do you make toric Great lenses question. or ATI wells slightly smaller with your CCC? Fantastic question. So the size of the capsular rescues is important. Um, and so I set mine at 4.9, so that comes out to an effective five millimeter. Perfect, so we'll take, um, now I'm checking my biometry right now, and we will use a 16 diopter TFNT0, please. So um, I'll come back to that question in just a moment. I just wanna show that we did the intraoperative aberometer, yep. um, and it's confirming the lens that we pre-selected, which is a 16 diopter um, uh, lens. So in this case, aberometry is just confirming the, the biometry that we, we did preoperatively. Now, what I would say as far as, I do not change the capsular exercise between uh, ATI well cases and regular cases um, because you want consistency, right? So you want your surgeries to be as consistent as possible. And one of the important things with uh, ATI wells and hitting your refractive target is that capsular exercise because that does influence your ELP or your effective lens position if that lens sits more anterior or more posterior, that's going to change your, uh, the outcome, uh, your refractive outcome. And so you really do want a consistent capsular exercise. So I strive in my manual cases to um, uh, try and do the same size capsular exercise that my 10 per second um, laser will do. All right, so this is the uh, the pan optics, this is a multifocal or trifocal lens. I want you to, I'm gonna focus in on here. You can see the rings here. And so uh, that's important because those rings are the good and the bad of this lens. Um, as, as most of you know, uh, there's a good side and a bad side to pretty much every lens that we use. Now, this is trimoxy. This is an injection I'm going to give intravitrally. So I'm going through the zonules and I'm injecting 0.2 cc's of a compounded pharmaceutical that has triencinolone and moxifloxacin. That way my patients do not have to take post-operative drops because the antibiotic and the steroid has been injected into vitreous where the vitreous allows for it to um, act as a, as a depot and you get a slow release, you get about six weeks worth of effect. All right, so now I'm removing the viscoelastic. I do like to go under the lens and remove any residual viscoelastic there. Now, the next important um, tip with a multifocal or, or, or any of the um, advanced technology lenses is centration. Centration is important. Now I have a digital marker that I can use, but I'd like to just show you today a, an alternative way. So what I do is I get the, um, the lens pretty close to where uh, I think it's in the center. I'm gonna go ahead and hydrate my wounds. So I've got a, a stable chamber and that lens is continuing to stay there. Whoops, got some air bubbles there. I'm gonna hydrate my paracentesis. So I have a, a moxifloxacin concentration. This is why I get the air bubbles in here. I have a little more BSS. I will try to flush some of those out. So the way that I try to get good centration is I'll have the patient fixate um, on the microscope lights. So I use a, a Zeiss uh, Lumera microscope and it has um, three 
uh, three light bulbs. You can see that in the Purkinje image there. Um, and so if I have the patient fixate on the center of those three light bulbs, then I will line the Purkinje images up onto the center of the IOL. Well. So Anne, if you can look up at the three light bulbs there and just look right in between the three of them. And then as you can see, as she does that, the center of the multifocal lens is right um, beneath the Purkinje image. So I found that to be uh, a no cost, easy way to get really good IOL centration. So um, I'll check my incisions here with a wet. They are sealed. My eye is uh, left at physiologic pressure. And that concludes this first case. And you did fantastic, great job. And so Kevin, that was a beautiful demonstration. I know you're heading over to give your PowerPoint. One question is, uh, do you prefer to make the main incision temporally or um, uh, superiorly? And the other yeah, question great. is, I noticed that you prefer to make your incision manually, not by femto. So if you could just talk through those two points. Sure, of course. So um, the first question, so I think where you make the incision, uh, the, the guiding principle there should be where you're comfortable. So I, I am a surgeon who sits, um, uh, at the 12 o'clock position. I sit at the head. So on a right eye, it's really easy for me to make a temporal incision. That's, so that's what I do. And that tends to work out better because most patients um, or a higher percentage of patients have, um, have uh, horizontal astigmatism. So by making a horizontal incision or an incision at 180, you are more likely uh, to help treat that astigmatism just with your primary incision. But I would say, again, your guiding principle should be where you're most comfortable because again, you, good surgery is comfortable surgery. And if you're uncomfortable because you're trying to make your incisions in a, in a strange place, that doesn't help you. So um, that's, uh, that's what I would recommend. We're gonna talk about this in a second, but uh, calculating your surgeon's induced astigmatism or your SIA is gonna be really important. And, and that, requires consistency. So you do want to make your incision consistently at the same place um, as often as you can. And then you just incorporate that SIA into your keratometry and your IOL calculation. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my, uh, share my screen here. Great. Can you guys see that? Perfect, Kevin. Okay. Fantastic. And then the to remind me the second question what oh the the incisions yes so that's personal preference whether you make manual incisions um i find that um when i use my femtosecond laser incisions i can't always get it right at the limbus um and i and so i just choose to make it manually i think the the quality and the integrity of the incisions are, are, are very very similar i don't think there's a huge difference there so i like the uh, i like being able to put that incision right where i want it because that's important all right, so let's dive into um, this talk. I'm gonna keep this pretty short just while my OR is turning over uh, for our second patient. This is entitled Getting Started with Advanced Technology IOLs. And this is um, the journey from becoming a cataract surgeon to a refractive cataract surgeon. And that's a journey I've been on for the last 16 years. And I just wanted to share some, uh, some pearls that I've learned along the way. So my three learning objectives for you today would be to understand uh, the patient selection and the preoperative evaluation for uh, any patient considering an ATIOL. Secondly, I want you to appreciate the nuances to successful refractive cataract surgery process. And it is a process. It's not just putting in a different lens. It actually is a process that involves your entire um, clinic, OR, everything. Um, and then I want you to comprehend principles for managing an unhappy ATIOL patient because anytime you have an ATIOL patient, they're different. They are paying money for an outcome. And if that outcome or that expectation is not reached, there's going to be some dissatisfaction. So you need to know how to handle that. So um, advanced technology lenses are becoming more commonplace globally. Um, and I think that it's quickly becoming a, a necessary skill set for most cataract surgeons. Patients want to be educated. They want to be given options um, regardless of, of, of where they are. Um, and I think that um, places like Erevan have proven that uh, ATIL wells can be an excellent way to cost cross subsidize. And so if you have patients willing to pay for premium services, that helps your organization provide care uh, for everybody who walks in your door. 
Um, so incorporating ATIOLs into your practice does require um, deliberate effort, though. It, it's not something you can just haphazardly do. It does take a lot of uh, pre-thought um, and deliberate action. Okay, so the types of uh, the ATIOLs. Um, again, this talk is not to go, designed to go into those critical details. So I'm just gonna make some broad categories. There's a multifocal category. You just saw a multifocal lens put in. They um, have the reputation of good near vision, but they also have a side effect of visual disturbances. And so you have to be comfortable or familiar with, with both of those. The next broad category is an extended depth of focus lens or an EDOF. That's what our second case will be. Um, they don't have the same side effect profile. So they don't tend to have visual disturbances as commonly. However, they're also not known for having as good of near vision. So again, each lens or each category of ATIOLs um, has positives and has some negatives. And so that's the fun part of this is, is learning that and presenting that to patients and trying to match the right lens with the right patient. Now there's also accommodating lenses like the crystal lens. There's newer, lens, newer accommodating lenses on the horizon. There's pinhole lenses. Pinhole lenses work great for complicated corneas or corneas with a lot of ectasia. Um, there are now lenses coming out with that are a combination of some of the above technologies. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's a lot of future technology. So there's a lot of research. There's a lot of uh, a lot of money being poured into this. So I think five years from now, we're going to see um, a lot of new technologies on the market. So again. The, the market share of ATIOLs is just continuing to grow. And so if you are a cataract surgeon, you're gonna to have to um, stay educated and involved with this. All right, so preoperative considerations. I just uh, wanted to share a few, uh, a few things. So um, what are the patient's visual goals? Hunter touched on this earlier. That's really the key. Um, I have patients all the time say, hey doc, I've worn my glasses for 40 years. If I don't wear glasses anymore, my, my spouse, my family, my kids, my grandkids, they won't recognize me. I don't wanna get out of glasses. Well, that's not a patient that um, is a good candidate for an ATIOL probably. So really what drives this is what are the patient's visual goals? And when you find that patient who is highly motivated to reduce their dependence on glasses, those are the ones that could be a candidate. Um, you also need to understand what compromises they're willing to accept. Each of these lenses has compromises associated with it. So you need to have a good understanding of that. Now, this is a global audience. The lenses that I'm presenting today are approved in the United States. They might not be approved in your region of the world and you might have something totally different. But the important point is that you as the surgeon become very, very comfortable and very familiar with the lenses that you're going to use. So do your homework, talk to colleagues, read the literature, find out what lenses that you have availability to, or that they are available to you, um, will work the best, and then become really, really familiar with those. Have confidence in them. Know what they can and can't do, because that's what you have to communicate to your patients. Patient education is critical. Um, they do, it does require more chair time. Um, if you don't educate patients, you will have unhappy ATIOL patients. So managing expectations, understanding expectations, educating patients on what these lenses can or can't do. So in my clinic, I've done some things to help with that additional chair time. One of them is I created personalized videos. Anybody can do this now with, the, with an iPhone, right? You create a video of you talking to your patient about the different options um, in cataract surgery and what these advanced technology lenses can do. And then I have my patients watch that video while they're dilating, waiting to see me for a consult. I also have done a lot of staff education to where my staff is very engaged. They're very educated about these ATIOLs and we all speak the same language. So they never say, you're gonna get out of glasses. I never say, you're gonna get out of glasses. We're gonna say, we use the best technology we have available to give you the best chance or the best probability of reducing your dependence on glasses. That's a very different statement than you're getting out of glasses. And so we're very deliberate that our entire staff um, is engaged in the process, can educate patients, can speak comfortably about ATIOLs to patients, but we do have to, there is an education process behind that. I'm having a little trouble advancing my slides here. There we go. 
All right, so you also wanna consider the personality type of the patient. We have to not only be ophthalmologists, but when we take on ATIOLs, we have to become a little bit of a, a psychologist as well. There are certain personality types that are just not suited for ATIOLs. I think kind of the, the running joke is engineers, you know, the, the person that's so um, focused on details, they might not have the same tolerance um, for some of the visual disturbances or side effects. So you have to tease that out a little bit. Um, you have to know, can the ATIOL meet their expectations? If a patient comes to you as their fourth, um, you know, their fourth cataract evaluation, and they have 19 pages of very detailed questions and they wanna know the molecular weight of the material used to make their ATIOL, that's probably not a good personality type for an ATIOL. So we do have to um, be prudent in, in selecting patients and making sure they're good candidates. Um, you could consider using a lifestyle questionnaire. So I do this in my clinic where a patient tells me what their, their uh, profession is, what their hobbies are, what they enjoy doing because some of the lenses work better in certain situations. For instance, if a patient is a truck driver who drives at night or a pilot who flies at night, they're not going to be the best multifocal candidate because they might get visual disturbances or glare and halo. Um, a patient who loves to spend a lot of time on the computer might be a good patient for uh, an extended depth of focus lens because they have good computer or intermediate distance focal points. So you need to understand the patient's lifestyle to match them to the correct lens. And as Hunter said at the very beginning, we wanna under promise and over deliver um, because again, this is expectation, uh, expectation management. Um, so when you're working up these patients, once you've selected a patient who might be a good ATI well candidate, you have to make sure their eyes healthy. So I do a macular OCT on all of these patients just to make sure I'm not missing a small epiretinal membrane or macular pathology. Um, they need to have healthy eyes, multifocals especially. Now, EDOF lenses are a little more forgiving, um, but they still require great visual potential. You also need very accurate and reliable measurements. So you have to pay attention to things like the anterior surface, tear film, corneal dystrophies, um, because those can affect your biometry. And if you don't have good biometry, you're probably not gonna have good results. So biometry is crucial. Um, I measure keratometry with three different devices and I compare those. Um, I do uh, incorporate my surgeon-induced astigmatism. So if you haven't done that yet, that's an easy thing to do. Um, there's uh, resources online for that. You need to optimize your IOL constants. So you don't just use the IOL constant off the box. Each surgeon is gonna have their specific constant. So you need to go through the process of doing that. Most biometers will do it for you if you just enter in the post-operative data. And you need to know who's doing your biometry measurements. So in my clinic, I have one primary person um, who does most of my biometry and she is excellent and she's so meticulous and she's so reliable. Um, and that's a big part of it. If you're in an institution where there's lots of different people doing biometry, there's gonna be variability there and that variability can, um, can affect your results. I showed this on the last talk we did in August about uh, toric lenses. This just shows that I check the cornea uh, measurements three different ways and I'm looking for consistency. So you can see here that the, the, all of the uh, flat and steep corneal measurements are very close to each other. The axis is very close to each other. So this is good consistency. I would feel confident in using these uh, biometry readings to pick an ATIOL. Okay, once we're in surgery, um, as I just showed you, you can use Purkinje images uh, for IOL centration. IOL centration is very important, which means the capsular rexus size is also very important. So really striving for a five millimeter um, capsular rexus or a capsular rexus that completely covers the optic of the IOL. Polishing the capsule can be helpful. Obviously you have to manage astigmatism. So either you're using the toric version of these lenses um, or doing uh, limbal relaxing incisions. Um, and then also just keep in mind, uh, if you have a complicated case, if you have capsular compromise, it's usually best to not put in that advanced technology lens because that lens has to be centered and the effective lens position is crucial. So that's when you have your backup plan. You, put, you still have to put safety first and a patient would rather have a centered monofocal lens than a decentered um, ATIOL any day, I promise you. 
Special considerations, uh, be very careful with post refractive eyes. This can be done, but that's kind of a, the next level of education. So when you're first starting off, I would avoid that. And I would grow into that with experience. If you have patients with mild glaucoma or epiretinal membranes, you can consider some of the extended depth of focus lenses, but I would not um, be in favor of using a multifocal lens. You wanna avoid those when patients have um, moderate or severe glaucoma, obviously macular disease, uh, significant dry eye, or that personality incompatibility. So you're really having to evaluate a lot. And then also don't forget about monovision, right? Monovision has been around for a long time and monovision works and it's successful at reducing dependence on glasses. So just using um, non-ATI OLs to do monovision. And then um, as I'm going to do in this next case, I'll do mini monovision with an extended depth of focus lens where I'll set one eye for distance and intermediate and the other eye will make just a little bit nearsighted, usually a half of a diopter. And that brings in a little bit better reading without sacrificing too much distance. And so that's, um, that's also an option. All right, I think they're ready for me next door. So um, I uh, will talk about the unhappy patient maybe during the, the question and answer, but basically if you have an unhappy patient, you just have to drill down as to what the problem is. What is it that's making them unhappy? Our tendency is to duck and hide. If you have an unhappy patient, you don't wanna see them. That's the patient that needs your attention the most. So you walk in there confidently and you say, um, I understand that you're not happy. I'm on your side. I'm going to do whatever I can to get you the vision that you want. Most of the time it's refractive error. And so you have to address that. And so um, we can talk about that in a little while, but you also need to rule out obviously the other causes. Is it dry eye? Is it CME? Is it posterior capsular pacification? Or is it the visual disturbance? So those are things that, we'll, that you'll need to, to think about, and we can talk about that um, during the question and answer. So fire away with any questions that you have there. So thank okay, you. so in summary, yeah, just patient education, selection, expectation management, um, and doing excellent biometry and surgery. No, I, I love that. And I think, you know, basically you can only go as high as your fundamentals and your foundation allow. And I really appreciated in the first case how you really spend time polishing. So you reduce the chance of a posterior capsular opacity. We really want to be careful. And you show that you look at the OCT before surgery to make sure there's absolutely no subtle or hidden macular pathology. And so with the unhappy patient, you really want to make sure you give them the fullest exam, looking at the tear film. Is there a dry eye? You want to look at the lens. Is it centered? Is there any opacity? And certainly you don't want to miss a subtle case of cystoid macular edema or CME. I know, Kevin, there's some questions about the um, medicine that you inject after surgery. We have two of those. So we'll get to those questions on the second case as you're injecting your uh, compounded medicine that has the antibiotic and the anti-inflammatory. Uh, but I do think that Kevin brings up th the point. You got to understand what's driving the patient's dissatisfaction. Was it their expectations? Was it the refractive error after the surgery? Or is there some subtle pathology? So Kevin, I see you're back at the microscope. The patient's well-centered. And um, I see that this one we're going to do manually. So uh, as, you're, as you're getting ready to do this surgery, we do want to uh, acknowledge that there are some people that have already appreciated the lifestyle questionnaire and hope that you can share that with us. And then also want to talk about some very specific things that we'll probably get to after this surgical demonstration. So we do have about six or seven questions at this time for you, Kevin. Very good. All right. Yeah. So we're back, uh, back started here. So then again, um, this is a manual case. So it's not using the femtosecond laser. And we're going to implant an Alcon Vividi uh, EDOF or extended depth of focus lens here. And you can see there's a, a reasonable size cortical and PSC, um, PSC cataract. Making my primary incision where I customarily do. Yeah, the lifestyle questionnaire, um, you know, most, uh, a lot of industries, so a lot of like Alcon and Alcon, they have their own. Um, there's some online. You know, there's a Dell questionnaire that can be accessed online. Um, so yeah, we'll try to provide some of those resources. So 
Um, let me show you here on this capsular rexus forcep, you can see these two marks. Those are the five millimeter marks. So if I put my, my, the end of my forcep here, I know the other end of my capsular rexus where it needs to be. So that's just one simple way trying to estimate a manual capsular rexus at five millimeters. There's also markers that can be used on the epithelium of the cornea. Yeah. That was a beautiful capsular rexus. And again, just that is one of the critical steps for torque as well as ATI well surgeries, making sure you have a very, very smooth, circular and centered capsular rexus. If it's decentered, Kevin, is, is that something that would change your decision making on implanting an ATI well? Great question. I think if it's mildly decentered, uh, no. I think if you have an anterior capsular tear, then yes, because that is going to most likely affect your ELP and could affect your IOL centration. So I'd really think twice about um, implanting one when you have an anterior capsular tear. If it's just decentered, I think that's a judgment call. If it's mildly decentered, no, I'm not worried about that. If it's dramatically decentered, yeah. Um, so if you, if you, again, if you just going back to the principle, if you have complications or difficulties, you might want to go with plan B and not implant an ECI alone. So I'm going to make my central group here. This cataract does have some density to it. Um, we'll go ahead and crack here. I will do a little shot. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I think this was the 72 year old man who has a three plus NSC, three plus cortical and three plus PSC. And preoperatively, even with correction, the patient was about 2200 and is myopic uh, with a, a vision of refractive error of about minus 2.50. So, um, you right. know, I, I think this is a, a great case for the demonstration of Vividy and looking at targeting a Plano outcome in the left eye for this case. That's right. So this, um, yeah, this patient has uh, a prolonged steroid oral steroid use. So I think that's contributed to the density of this cataract and the PSC formation. But he is a uh, he loves computer. When I when I did the lifestyle questionnaire and had a discussion with him, he's naturally been a minus two most of his life, and he spends a lot of his day on the computer, and he enjoys doing that without having to wear glasses. So, uh, but he also lost his driver's license and. Ability to drive. So he's like, hey, if I can um, get back to driving, but also still have some great computer vision, that would meet my goals. So that's why we went with, um, uh, with a Vividy or an EDOF because they have really good intermediate focal points for computer vision, but it's also going to give him a good distance vision to where he can, uh, where he can drive. So you can see here, this is a pretty thick epinuclear plate. I decided to just remove this with us the irrigation aspiration, not the FACO, um, because it was a little adherent to the capsule and I just it's safer to do that. So what I'll do is um, just take my second instrument here, my sidewall chopper, and I'll just um, encourage or, or help this, uh, this epinucleus along here. Um, again, some people would say, go after this with your FACO, and you certainly can. But again, there's a lot of fibrosis here and um, I don't want to risk any capsular damage by FACOing too close to my capsule. I really like to keep my FACO tip right in the central safety zone and do more work with um, my second instrument and the IA. So let me just clean up the last little bit of this cortex here. So in this patient, the other thing we're going to do is in his dominant eye, we're going to set him for um, a Plano target for distance. I'll usually expect to get them a reasonable um, intermediate vision, but I'm not expecting this near vision to be um, superb. Sometimes we get it, but not always. And then in this eye, we're gonna set the vision uh, for a minus 50 outcome. And by giving him a minus 50 outcome, it'll probably be 20, 40 or so in the next, but that brings in the intermediate and near vision, especially a little more. So it's not true monovision, it's what's been called mini, monovision or modified monovision. A lot of DSC here. So I'll go to my polish settings. 
see if we can tease off some of this. I'll also go here under the interior capsule here and then do a little more polishing. I'll show you what I use with lots of different ways. You know, if you have silicone IA tips, obviously that's helpful. <clears throat> I'll need the bimanual when I go back to that and I'll need the uh, uh, squeegee, the Terry squeegee. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in my viscoelastic. As you can see, there's still a little piece of cortex here. So I'm gonna get that after I put the lens in because that's a higher risk piece of cortex to get. As you can see, it's way underneath my incision. Um, so I'm gonna just make a mental note that it's there. And I'm going to use a bimanual technique to remove that after we put the lens in. Um, and I have the cherry squeegee. And then um, the other thing I'm gonna do here, the cherry squeegee, oh, thank you, is this is called a cherry squeegee silicone tip um, on a canyon. So you can use this when you have posterior subcapsular cataract and it just does a nice job of delicately removing some of that fibrosis so that posterior capsular fibrosis there. And then I'll take my provisc again to try to blow some of that out of the way. Here. And that'll allow me to get a good um, aberometry measurement. Now, of course, if you don't have aberometry, you don't have to do this. Again, I use it just um, as a belt and suspender. So in other words, it's just verifying the biometry I did. Um, Kevin, can, can you talk a little bit about how you're selecting the target refraction in this patient when it comes up? Absolutely. How, yeah. So again, that's that's um, that's where that lifestyle questionnaire really helps. Go ahead and capture. And understanding what the patient's goals are. So for instance, <clears throat> um, I did a Vividy patient uh, today who his primary goal is not to be able to see the dashboard of my car. I don't do a lot of read, I like to see. Um, <clears throat> so let me have a, a 19. Yeah, give me the 19.5. So here I'm selecting a 19.5 diopter lens because that's going to give them close to a half a diopter of myopia. So expecting distance vision of 2040 and then good intermediate and near. And then with his other eye, his left eye is dominant eye, I'll set that one more for uh, plain eye for the distance. And so that was just a discussion that I had with the patient finding out what his goals were. His goals were distance vision, wanting to um, be able to, to drive at night and then also see the computer. That's what he, was really important to him. I had a, um, other patients who say, hey, driving is important, seeing the dashboard of my car or, or my iPad is important, but I don't really do a lot of reading. Um, and so maybe we'll do <clears throat> um, both eyes set for Plano with an EDOF. The panoptics, like we saw in the first patient, that actually gives the fullest, most complete range of vision. Patients have good distance, intermediate and near with that lens. And so if the goal is to get the most, um, the, the greatest range of vision with the least amount of glasses in my hands, I've been most successful with that panoptics. However, a panoptics being a multifocal does come with the potential side effect of glare, halos, starburst, or, or what I call visual disturbances. And so not all patients will tolerate that. Um, and so most patients will, and I will say the newer multifocal lenses on the market are much um, uh, better than the earlier generations. And so the, the, the visual disturbances are lessening as the technology improves. So as you can see, this EDOF looks like a monofocal lens. Now, if you look right here in the center, as you catch the reflection, sometimes you might see there is a little raised button in the center of the lens, but that's it. So you can tell that this is very different from a multifocal um, and you can understand why there's um, not a lot of visual disturbance with this lens. This is the trimoxy again. So yeah. So Kevin, real quick, one question we had is: Does it matter where the IOL haptics are positioned vertically or horizontally? Does that affect anything with ELP or centration? Um, I'm not aware of that. On that. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's debates on that. I'm not aware that there's conclusive evidence on that. So in this case, I'm aligning them vertically because I need to get this piece of cortex here and I don't want the haptic in the way. So I'm just going to, what I've done here is I've taken the aspiration port um, and separated it from my coaxial into a bimanual handpiece. As you can see, as I did the trimoxy injection, um, I uh, hit the ciliary body and caused a little bit of a hemorrhage. So that is one of the side effects of um, doing the, the trimoxy uh, injection. And that happens occasionally. So I'll show you some tricks we can use for that. Okay, so I'm gonna remove that piece of cord sex here. And I like how you, you, you stopped and used the optic and the IOL to protect you from the bag and go after that tricky sub-incisional cortex. That's always a, a, a smart move to do. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's right. Here, right on, if you look at the center of the lens, you can see the reflection there. You yep. see the, the, the EDOF portion of, uh, of this lens. I don't hit the ciliary body very often, but I sure did today, didn't I? So um, the trimoxy is now in the vitreous. So we have the steroid and the antibiotic there. And we have the DSX. So what I'm gonna do with this hemorrhage is I'm gonna try to uh, just inflate the incisions here, increase the pressure for a moment and see if we can use a little tamponade. Tamponade effect here. Yeah, it looks like it's slowing a bit. Yep. So if I just put a decent pressure here in the eye, yeah, I've got the pressure probably at about 20 or so. Now let that sit there for just a moment. Um, that should stop uh, stop the bleeding. So um, maybe well, I'm going to give that just a minute. I have a little more BSS. Um, tell me some of the questions that you had uh, teed up there, either about the trimoxy or. Yeah. Uh, or so with other. the tri one of the questions with the trimoxy is, does that create, is there a steroid induced glaucoma or do you have to worry about post-operative IOP spikes with the concentration of triamcinolone or the steroid in this? Um, that's a great question. So initially, yes. Um, but as, so I use uh, the Empremis compound that's formulated uh, by a compounding phar pharmacy. We don't do any of this compounding myself. And they have used kind of a proprietary way of titrating down the triamcinolone concentration. So now I use a little bit less uh, concentration and a little bit less volume. And since we've done that, we're not seeing pressure spikes. I have about less than 5% of patients who have a steroid induced, uh, a steroid induced pressure spike. Um, and so um, that is really not uh, a problem. The only difference is, is yes, yeah, so if you have a patient with advanced glaucoma or moderately advanced glaucoma, I might not put trimoxia in because if they have a tenuous enough uh, optic nerve, um, then I don't wanna uh, you know, risk, you know, risk that at all. And Kevin, I appreciate how you're trying to raise the uh the pressure inside the eye to tamponade that bleed. Would an air bubble be something also, or you think we're gonna get this to stop just by hydrating the wounds and getting it above 30? That's a great point. I guess we could try, um, could try an air bubble here. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put an air bubble in. I'm gonna leave him here for just a second. We can go do the question and answer. Yeah. Um, and, then, um, and then I'm gonna come back uh, after the, uh, the tamponade has been sitting there for just a few minutes to make sure that the uh, that the, the bleeding has stopped. And if I give him just a couple of minutes like that, I think that that'll uh, that that'll do it. And then what I do is I just as I just did, I'll, I'll rinse out the the heme as much as possible. I exactly. am going to uh, I am going to put him on uh, some uh, topical steroid in addition to the trimoxy just to help treat that heme. And usually within two days, that theme is completely gone, and yes. we don't see um, uh, we don't see any more. So, Kevin, right. I can so, I can start reading some of the questions to you while we wait for the tamponade to take effect. 
Just for the okay. first case, it was a be beautiful demonstration of a patient with a panoptics going in the second eye as well. What was your target refraction and what is your key? I know you really try to get an understanding of their visual needs and what is the refraction in the contralateral eye, but what is your typical post-op target refraction and what was it for that case? For the first case was Plano. So again, that's going to be IOL dependent. So um, there are so many different AT IOLs out there that have different focal points. Um, that's what's going to uh, dictate what uh, what target refraction you're aiming for, along with what the patient's goals are. But with most multifocals, I'm trying to target Plano. So I'm gonna to go to whatever lens is gonna get me closest to Plano. The only time I don't do that is, it, for instance, with these uh, EDOF lenses, if I'm gonna do a mini monovision and I might set the non-dominant eye to a minus 50. Otherwise, I'm usually aiming for Plano. And, and it's always better, better to leave a patient slightly myopic than to have the hyperopic surprise. So if there's any concern, you're always gonna cheat a little towards the myopic side. Is that correct, Kevin? I, most of the time that's correct. However, with some of the multifocal lenses, um, some of the near focal points are a little closer. Um, we had this with some of the original restore lenses, the plus four, so it was a very short focal distance. If you came out minus, that would bring the focal point so close that it wasn't yeah. practical. So there are certain lenses where you might not use that principle, but I would say by and large, yes, you're correct. Most lenses we are going to um, aim more for uh, Plano, maybe slightly myopic. No, that's a great question. One of the questions was um, in the first case, there was some vitreous floaters. I think that, you know, you have such a high resolution microscope. Would that ever have you lean towards a trifocal? Do you find the vitreous, if a patient has a lot of uh, vitreous floaters, does that in any way impact your decision-making for an ATIOL? That's a great question. Um, and that's something that's really hard to predict. I will tell you that some patients, just with cataract surgery in general, right? Sometimes notice their floaters more. We stir the floaters up with cataract surgery sometimes. And so I do occasionally have patients that complain of floaters um, being more prominent and more bothersome. However, I find that to be true regardless of what lens implant I use. So I don't know that I use that as a direct um, determinant on if, on if a patient can get an ATIOL um, because I haven't found a, a real strong corollary. I just make sure we educate the patients and we do give that to them in writing as part of their preoperative information is that, hey, Floaters are part of the deal. You're not, you know, this isn't going to fix your floaters so patients understand that. But I don't think I use that information to decide between lens and lens. No, that's a great question. And one of the questions with uh, ATI wells, and I know this is more with historic lenses that you have experience with. Do you ever look at angle kappa? If someone has a strong angle kappa, is that anything that you look at? And how do you measure that in a very busy clinic like yours? Yeah, so I cheat. Um, I use, uh, I have a, a digital marker, which I didn't show today, but I have the Varion digital marker. And with that Varion, I can um, have an overlay on my microscope that shows um, the center of the undilated pupil and the center of the visual axis. Um, I think there's still some debate on what we should truly be using. I tend to go for the center of the visual axis, which is why I line my lenses on the, the for NG images when a patient is fixating. Um, and I have not, uh, to my knowledge, I've not had to reposition or have a problem with a, a decentered IOL. So I don't, I think that sometimes becomes a little more of an academic discussion than a discussion of uh, true functionality in my experience. Um, so I don't measure it. You know, I don't take the time to measure it in pre-op. I'm just using kind of the tried and true method of getting it as close to that visual axis as I can. And Kevin, a great question that one of the doctors asked is, have you ever planted an ATIOL, a single piece ATIOL in the sulcus? And so- Never. Is, yeah, I, I think, and why not? Is that because of rotation? Is that because of UGG syndrome? What, what, what is your decision-making there? Yeah, so one piece lens just is not designed to go into, uh, into the sulcus. And um, there's a, a very high probability that it would be center. UGG syndrome is a, a real possibility rotation. Um, you know, th those haptics are designed to have friction against the capsule to keep them from rotating. And when there's no capsule there, they're going to rotate, they're going to move. So um, I would highly discourage putting any type of, of single piece lens in the sulcus, but especially an advanced technology lens. So again, if you have capsular compromise, 
go with a three piece lens, do something that's more stable for the sulcus if you have to put a lens in the sulcus. Another great question is, you know, and I know you, you do meticulous polishing to reduce the chances of a of posterior capsular opacity. If someone needs a YAG laser, do you try to make it a very small opening or do you try to make it a big opening with a multifocal or EDOF lens? So with an ATIOL, how does that impact your YAG size for a capsulotomy? Great question. Again, depends on the ATIOL, but if we're talking specifically about multifocals, um, the first question I answer is, is there any chance that I'm going to need to um, exchange this lens? So most of the time when I'm doing a YAG, it's just because years after surgery, patient develops PCO and their vision drops off. They were happy with their lens before that. So I'm not going to worry about exchanging a lens. So I'll go ahead and do a YAG and I can make that YAG as, as big as I need it. So I'll usually make it three to four millimeters at least so that it's incorporating most of those rings. Um, now, if there's a patient who is early on after surgery and they have early PCO, and they're not totally satisfied with their um, uh, with their vision, and I'm not sure if they're maybe I'm going to have to explant this lens. But I still decide to do the YAG. I will make a smaller YAG intentionally, yeah, just for that. Um, but I would say most of the time I'm going to just make a three to four millimeter, uh, usually a four millimeter circumference uh, for the for the YAG and then multifocal lens. And one question, you know, certainly, uh, Kevin, you're you're um managing this case and waiting for the patient to tamponade. Was the patient on any blood thinners, number one? And they were, would intracameral sure. epinephrine also help? So I know you put it in an air bubble, I, you raise the intraocular pressure. Would intracameral epinephrine help? And was the patient on blood thinner? Yes, the patient was on blood thinners, was anticoagulated. And so that's, I think, why we saw so much bleeding. And I think epinephrine's a good choice. So um, in just a minute, I'm going to step back and see how um, see how if our tamponade has worked and if, if it has, then I'm going to be able to finish. If not, then I'll probably go toward, uh, towards some, some epinephrine. We're also making sure the blood pressure um, is uh, good. Yeah, my staff saying it looks like the bleeding stopped. So maybe okay, what I'll do fantastic. is sign off here in just a minute and go, yeah. and go finish, uh, finish this case so that, uh, um, oh. and we can follow up with other questions. Are there any other pressing questions we should hit before I leave? I think we got most of them, Kevin. I can answer some of them, and we're going to reference people to go to the CyberSight library to see some of your prior surgeries where you talked about similar things about your FACO technique. So uh, again, I just want to thank you and your staff. A great day of uh, ATIOL surgery. Uh, we really appreciate that you showed two different types of lenses, two different types of technique, and two different types of technology. So again, Dr. Barber, we just want to thank you for everything you do with Orbis. And this uh, lecture, this webinar will be available on the library. For those who want to see it, you go to cybersite.org. And then you'll see in the far right, there's a library section that you can filter for surgeries, lectures, and cataracts. So Dr. Barber, we, you, you nailed it. You, got, you finished with two minutes to spare. We might stay mm -hmm. a few more minutes and um, answer some questions, but... All of these questions that the team are asking and the audience are asking about are found in the CyberSight Library. So thank you so much and uh, have a great day, okay? Yeah, thanks you guys. Have a great day. Thanks again. Well, um, again, I just wanna thank our audience. Uh, obviously this was a, a, a very good day where we did our first demonstrations of the ATIOL uh, cases. Just a few questions that were remaining how do you do LRI surgeries in a dissatisfied patient? Um, certainly those are something that you want first the eye to stabilize after surgery. You want to repeat and look at what are the Ks. And there are already in the CyberSight library uh, lectures on how to do astigmatism management at the time of surgery. Uh, obviously we now also have the toric intraocular lenses to manage that, but when there's post-operative astigmatism, LRIs or limbal relaxing uh, incisions are fantastic management strategies as long as you have good algorithms and have good experience with them. Another question was about TriPam Blue. Obviously this was a fairly dense lens and we noted that it didn't have the best red reflex. So we could have used TriPam Blue to stain the capsule, although Dr. Barber has a lot of experience. I really appreciated how he has the forceps that have exactly the calipers or the ruler so he can reproduce a very consistent size 
And I know there were questions about the size or the diameter of the CCC, that was five. But um, certainly if you have any questions about your capsular rexus, Tripam Blue is a fantastic management strategy. We did discuss using intracameral epinephrine. The good news is the air bubble and the raised intraocular pressure for a minute or two stopped the bleeding, but that is something that was a good management strategy, as well as putting an OVD in the eye to raise the pressure and help with the tamp tamponade. Certainly a question from an anonymous attendee about pupil abnormalities. Obviously, if there's an irregular pupil, you could have irregular light entering the eye. You could have an inconsistent uh, pupillary constriction. So certainly examining the pupil and if there is a sphincter tear or if there's a hole in the iris, you definitely want to rethink using an ATIOL uh, lens because the patient may have either you know, glare or other problems with those uh, lenses. Certainly, uh, and again, I think um, Dr. Barber talked about this, is pupillary size does matter. And that's why if you looked at the pre-op measurements, he does look at the mesopic and scotopic conditions. It's a great question. You can't over-measure and over-examine uh, your cataract patients. It's when you go through them too quickly and miss something about a pupillary defect, uh, a small macular membrane, dry eye or guttata of the posterior cornea that you're gonna find yourselves with an unhappy patient. So certainly we wanna measure twice and cut once on all patients, but especially the ATI wells. Uh, again, I wanna thank the audience members who suggest ideas to tamponade or stop the ciliary body bleeding. I think it has come and has stopped with the air bubble and the raised intraocular pressure. Certainly um, uh, there are, and Kevin will be giving a lecture on what to do with unhappy um, ATIOL patients. I know Kevin does a lot with IOL exchanges. You can certainly do LASIK if it is a refractive error. It depends on what is the cause. So um, certainly I think before we jump to LASIK as the solution for enhancements, we first wanna make sure it is a refractive error and not another cause. Um, certainly with multifocal lenses, I think you heard Kevin say, if there's concerns about the stability of the anterior capsule, or if there is a posterior capsular rupture, I don't think we would recommend a multifocal lens for multiple reasons. One, it could be decentration. The other is, you know, if you're trying to put this now in the sulcus, you're now putting a one piece IOL in the sulcus where there can be rotational instability, there can be UG syndrome and other problems. And again, I just wanna thank all of you for your support and for making sure that we had a great and highly interactive webinar uh, today. We have several exciting webinars coming up this week, including, um, uh, excuse me, next week with glaucoma. So again, I encourage all of you to take a moment and go to the CyberSight library. And in the library, you can search for all the prior webinars, all the lectures, books, things that you would like to learn, or maybe even show your colleagues in uh, CyberSight. So I'm gonna show um, that uh, right uh, now in the chat, if you go to CyberSight library. All right, well, with that, I wanna thank Dr. Barber and his staff again. And I certainly want to thank the CyberSight team for such a beautiful uh, support and really high quality video uh, displays.